Welcome to the Block Party. My name is Seth Kushner, and today we've got a special guest to help us uh, pick out those last-second Mother's Day gifts, the NHL insider uh, from Sportsnet, Elliot Friedman. Welcome to the show. My pleasure, Seth. Glad to be here. Listen, so what? welcome. This is, you know, we're taping this on Mother's Day right now. You know, I think you were you were a little bit late. You had to go get a, a Mother's Day gift last second, right? No, 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 that's not. I want this stated for the record. It's not my Mother's Day gift was on time. OK, what, what, what my wife said, I don't want anyone thinking I'm that terrible a human being. I know I'm a terrible human being, <laughs> but I don't want to be seen as that terrible a human being. Um, there's levels of terribleness, I guess. My wife wanted to go for on a coffee run. So I was like, you know, it's Mother's Day. It's her day. If she wants to go on a coffee run, we're going on a coffee run. So that's why I was a couple of a couple months late. But the late the gift is bought. It's I'm just waiting for it to be delivered, but it's bought. Elliot, let me ask you this. I'm taking my wife tonight and my daughter. She's almost five. I'm taking them to the lightning game tonight. Now, yep. okay. I did use my hookup and get the tickets for free. Is that an adequate Mother's Day present? Taking your wife to a playoff game. I, I think for sure. Here, here's my question, Seth. Does your wife like the gift? Yes, but I do fear that later on this evening, she might start yelling at me and crying that I didn't, you know, I didn't put any thought into anything. I didn't buy her anything. And I, so I, I fear that later on today, but right now she seems happy with it. Well, I, I can't speak to the state of your relationship. <laughs> I, I, you know, I'm not good at giving advice about that way, but generally my rule of thumb is if you say we'd like, I'd like to do this, and she says yes, you're in a good place. Like that's what I would say. Maybe just don't tell her you got the tickets for free. Maybe that's the, that's a like cut, cut this part out of the conversation so she can't see it. She knows that's one of the perks of the job. You know, is that I get oh, okay. to, I get to interview some of the players, and then when it they, playoff time, I bother Brian Breesman and he hooks me up. So I do want to touch on something that I feel like maybe a lot of people would look over with you, Elliot. Um, mm -hmm. It's in your Wikipedia. And I know we don't use Wikipedia for a lot of stuff, but there okay. is, there is a sentence in there that we can't skip over. And it goes born and raised in a middle-class Jewish home. And, and I was too. And I, that's a, like to make it out alive, I think is a big deal. So I don't want to just look over that part of your life at all. Well, I got to tell you, I've never looked at my Wikipedia page, so I, I didn't realize it said that there. I That is true. I mean, um, uh, yeah, that is true. I mean, uh, there were yes, yes, there were challenges like everybody has challenges. We had some really tough years, but those are good for, you know, putting hair on your chest, as, as people say. <laughs> Um, but yes, that, that is accurate. I, now I'm curious to know what else is on the page, considering I didn't even know that was there. Okay. I'd love to know who edited that to put that there. It, it, it probably was somebody like my dad or something. Yeah, you know? I was going to say like my parents. Yes. It sounds about right. Yes. I won't tell you what, I won't tell you what else is on there, but I, I found that I just want people to know, like, you know, growing up in a middle-class Jewish home, that's the school of hard knocks. Okay. That's not just like an easy life. Okay. I didn't go do mother's day with my mom this morning. So she didn't give me a guild trip. Then I got the thing, you know, the stuff with the wife. So there's a lot to balance when you're, uh, when you're living that Jewish lifestyle with the, with the mom and the wife. Um, <laughs> Elliot, listen, I want to know, you've got the podcast 32 thoughts. Uh, it seems like you are all over the place. I've seen all the hits that you do. You do the podcast mm -hmm. consistently. Where, where are some of the oddest places you've had to set up shop and record your podcast? Cast. uh well i mean the car cast became a big thing last year because you know we we want to get these things out promptly and we want to get them out as early in the day as possible and you know during the playoffs you got to sleep you got to sleep in because if you don't you're going to run out of steam pretty quickly so the driving home car cast became a bit of a unique one and uh, our editor our producer amal really hates them but the audience seems to really like them and the audience wins right so we still do them uh, I do remember one time I did an NHL network hit. I had to pull over. I was driving uh, in Denver uh, after an event and I had to pull over into the par parking lot of the McDonald's and do it there. And they're like, where are you? And I, I told them where I was and they, they made me like show the McDonald's and things like that. So, um, you know, the other day I did one standing in our wardrobe room where all the suits hang and they were looking, yeah, they were looking at all those. They like it when we do. I, I've done that before, and that one always gets a lot of positive reviews, so I, I, I like to do it. Um, you know, I, I think generally, um, generally when you do them by phone, you can really do them in some kooky places. Like, I've done some in bathrooms before. I've done some, like, on, like, at hotel pools before. 
Um, I remember in Vegas, there was one time I did one and uh, I, I made the mistake of leaving my phone in the sunlight and it overheated during the hit. So I, I think those are the ones that usually cause you a lot of problems. Like I, I remember I did one and when it was over, the producer said, we didn't want to say this on the air, but are you in a bathroom right now? They <laughs> go, how do you know? And they go, cause it sounds like you're in a tin can. So producers and, and sound experts, they can re- really figure out these things. Yeah. They, they're on top of it, but no, the regular, the regular ear, they can't pay attention. So that wasn't your closet at all that you were doing the hit from the other day. That was the wardrobe room there. Well, we used to have, we moved buildings last year. So our studios moved from uh, downtown Toronto to sort of um, north end of downtown Toronto. And when we were last couple of years during COVID, we had our own dressing rooms. So sometimes I would do them in my own room, which had its own, you know, wardrobe, would own change area. But this year we have a common one for, you know, the men on one side and the women uh, on the other. I mean, we're not, you know, not everybody's getting changed in the same place. <laughs> but so I was in the men's change room uh, and I checked to make sure that like uh, Kevin Bieksa wasn't in various stages of undress before I did it because nobody needs to see that. <laughs> no, although that's nice to go viral. Um, I, there was another question. Okay, so earlier in your career, you started off doing play by play, right? I didn't start off doing play by play, but I did some play by play. I did one NHL game. I did a few NBA games. I did some, uh, I did a couple Blue Jays games. And, uh, you know, I, I did, uh, I, I've done some play-by-play along the way. What, what's, what's the most difficult sport to, to kind of call, whether it's color or play-by-play? I've kind of heard it's always baseball because there's just a, a lot of time that you have to fill in there. Uh, I, I don't know that I would be able to answer that really well because I, I, like, I don't look at it that way, Seth. Like, I really like doing it, and I really like – like, I've done some Olympic sports, like swimming, volleyball, and things like that. And I've done badminton, and I've done table tennis. Like, I just really like it. I, I don't see it as difficult. I see it as simply as – I think that the toughest challenge of it sometimes is the, the temptation to just talk over everything. Like, sometimes it's just better to let it breathe, let the audience or the sound – tell the story and i found over the years that's the toughest thing bob cole was the best at it letting the uh letting the crowd breathe um you know i like doing it i miss doing it uh but my role is 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 no longer doing that right so uh everybody does their role what is what is calling table tennis like i mean how do you even get ready for that well i think the thing is and actually to be honest I, i did more badminton than i did table tennis and the thing about badminton was you generally let the play go un, you know, untouched because one of the things about badminton is, is the sound, the whoosh, 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 whoosh. And people really like that. So you can generally let them listen to that. And what you made sure you, the, the thing you know is you have to know the rules. Like, like what's the score? How does the score work? Um, you know, what are the rules of the basic thing? And also you have to know the competitors. So I would do research on the competitors. And I talk about what countries were good at it and, you know, who the champions were. And you find as long as you have enough of that, you're, you're okay. The funniest thing I remember once is, um, you know, when I, when I used to work at my previous station, CBC, they had the rights to some Toronto FC, like soccer. And I didn't used to work those games, but they were stuck one summer. They were really shorthanded because of staffing or whatever. And they said, can you work one soccer game for us? And I said, sure, no problem. And so I was the sideline reporter for soccer and I, I did a whole bunch of research and uh, the, we were coming to the soccer event was following like the Canadian track and field championships in New Brunswick. And about 15 minutes before broadcast time, uh, we got a call saying the truck had like a transformer blue or a power failure at these world championships and they were going off the air. They couldn't, they couldn't finish the show. So they, they said to us, you guys have to start early and you have to kill an extra 15 minutes. So we did. And like every fact I had put together for that match, I, I used in the first 15 minutes. And, I, and after it was over, and you know, those are the moments you're kind of proud of because they're unscripted. And I, I remember I said to the producer, I said, don't come back to me the rest of the show. Everything I prepared with, I just used. <laughs> 
you left you left it all out there. Now I some, left it I left it all on the field, Seth. I left, you left it all it. on the field. <laughs> you, yeah. you, gave, you gave them a good 15 minutes and look yeah. at it. They, they it's their fault for when they decided to use that right at the beginning. You know, tell me the other night. Obviously, Louis Domingue's been a story of the playoffs, the spicy pork and broccoli. And and you took that for a spin the other night, right? Yeah, we had a spicy pork and broccoli. I saw the penguins last night put it on their menu, which I thought was was really clever and really funny. Um, yeah, we, uh, one of our, uh, producers, uh, a guy by the name of Osama Farouk, he, um, he came up with the idea, like, do you want to try some, put some on the set or try some? So initially it was, you know, put it on the set and, you know, we said, if we're going to put it there, we got to eat it. So it, uh, at puck drop just before Pittsburgh Rangers game two, we were all looking at it and I said, man, if it's here, we got to eat it. And I took the plunge and the other three guys joined me. It was, it wasn't bad. I, I don't know if it was the same quality of the stuff that Domingue ate, but it was pretty good. How would you rate your performance that night? Like how many goals do you feel like you gave up, you know, throughout the show? Do you feel like you did a good job? No, I'm, I'm leaky. I'm like a sieve. Like uh, they all, they go through me a lot. <laughs> Elliot, listen for, for fans, you know, some of the breaking news and stuff, you know, the trades, the hiring the firing that comes out of nowhere you're on the inside, but has there been anything over the last, you know, over your career or the last couple of years that even you heard news and took you by surprise or you go, wait, am I reading this correctly? Um, you know, yes, that, I think that always happens. Um, sometimes, um, sometimes I, I think what happens is uh, you do a double take. A lot of the time, you know, it depends. Like, there's some people, if they call me and tell me something, it's gold. I, I, I know what's happening, particularly if, um, you know, they're, they're directly involved in it. Um, but there's other times you look at it and you're like, oh, my God, like, I, I better double check this. Um, and, like, sometimes that happens with trade requests. Sometimes that happens with trades. Um, you know, I remember trade deadline a couple of years ago when, when with the Detroit-Washington trade, Mantha Vrana. You think you have you you have a handle on everything, and all of a sudden, like something comes at you out of nowhere, and you're like, "What the hell? Where did that come from?" Um, uh, I, I remember when one. Of, I'll give you an example. Uh, a couple of years ago, or last summer, when Braden Point signed his extension in, in Tampa, somebody tipped me off on that one, and I, like I was like, "Whoa!" And they said, "Look out, Braden Point, eight times." And they they didn't know exactly the number. I guess it came out at nine point two, but it was in that area. And they said eight at Braden Point eight times nine ish, and it just came out of nowhere. And I was like, "Woo!" And I, I was like, "I better check." And you know, the thing is, like Julian Breeze was a vault. Like he's not going to help you on this one. <laughs> and and uh, so you're working it, you're working it, and you're and you're working it. And, and finally, someone says, "Yeah, if you said something like that, you wouldn't be in the wrong." And that's kind of the way it goes, uh, Seth. But there are always things that that pop out. I remember. You know, I'll give you another one. When uh, a couple of years ago, I, I think I was, I can't remember, but I think I was one of the first, if not the first to report that Kucherov was going to miss most of the season. Mm. And I remember when that one first came across, you're like, what? Like, you know, like, what, what is this? And uh, I, I remember that was one that, that really surprised me. I didn't report when Stamkos returned, but when, you know, remember he did that in the middle of the week, it was even three or four days before UFA. I remember when that news started to come out, we were like, wait a sec, isn't he meeting with teams today or something like that? Like sometimes, you know, you know how uh, everything goes. My grandmother had a line, you plan, God laughs. And, you know, there's always things that come out. You're sitting there going, oh, my goodness. Well, it kind of seems like everything that JBB does in Tampa, we go, it comes out of nowhere. Was the He Hagel, tries. Yeah. Was the Hagel deal, was that, I mean, obviously Hagel was kind of being talked about. Was it a surprise that the Lightning won out and they grabbed him at the deadline? No, I, like I think the tough thing was figuring out where he was going, um, but nobody was surprised when it was Tampa. Like you guys are in it to win it, and we all knew this year that you had a, a good row Coleman Gord hole, and you were going to try to fix it if you could, and uh, and you did. And you know by going out and get Hagel and Paul, I think I think now when I think now we expect it, Seth. Like we're almost like a couple of years ago, Julian tried to sell us all on it doesn't make sense to trade first rounders for rentals and things like that um um and uh you know uh and he you know he don't don't trade first and he did he did like i was one of the guys who wrote about like this is his philosophy and in some ways he's kept true to that generally he trades first for guys who have um 
he trades first for guys who uh, who have term. But I think right now we're in a situation where we expect this from the Lightning. As long as they're in contention to win, we expect them to do it. So I don't think I don't. Sometimes the name might surprise us, but we're not surprised they do it. You know, you've been around the game a long time. You've been around different sports, including, you know, badminton, table tennis, everything. What is it about, you know, and I've done different stuff being in radio for a long time. What is it about hockey guys? Is there a big deal going down? Elliot? What's happening? I see it. there's got to be something breaking news. I'm somebody gonna... just somebody just called me and sent me a note on something. So I'll, I'll, I'll be looking into it. So okay. if you see me looking on my phone, then uh then uh, then that's exactly what I'm, I'm doing. Yeah, this is what this is what it's like when my wife is talking to me. You're doing what I do. My wife talks to me so I can see now why you got it going on, man. Listen, I can't wait to see what the breaking news is later. But what I did want to know is oh, what is it about hockey guys that that makes them different from all their athletes? Just the way that you can have a conversation with them, the way they go about things. Do you, I get asked that question a lot, you know, interviewing guys. And, and I really don't know what it is. Do you have any idea? Well, you know, I, I'll, I'll say this. I think that, um, you know, I think the last couple of years have been kind of tougher up here in Canada. We don't get to go to dressing rooms anymore. And across the league, you don't get to go to dressing rooms. And I really miss that set. I think that, um, you know, I really like talking to people and uh, I find that, you know, I mean, some, I think, I think generally hockey players are quieter than most athletes, but once, you know, it's like, it's like, it's like life. The more you get to know somebody, the more you really enjoy conversing with them. And I find that hockey players in particular really like talking about their craft, like whether it's their stick or their skates or a way that they approach the game. Um, they're really good about talking about that kind of thing. And I think the young generation set the, like they're way out there. Like, you know, the, the Trevor Zegras and the Austin Matthews, like Matthews is quiet, but he talks like the way, with the way he dresses or with some of the things he does. And, and we know Zegras is way out there. He's not afraid to be quiet. And, um, you know, I, I think that, I think the hockey players have tended to be quieter more than other sports. Like I broke in covering basketball and those guys said what, whatever was on their mind. It was such a great learning experience for me. The thing that I really learned at that time was, you know, I didn't have a lot in common when it came to background with a lot of the basketball players, but if you're around each other every day and, and they get to know your face and they see the way you comport yourself and you see the way that they act, you build bridges, right? And I think the hockey players are the same way. I, I just think that the one thing that really helps me is, is working on Hockey Night in Canada and, and the national broadcast. Like Hockey Night in Canada has a big name. And I think when you look at, like, for example, like TNT or NBC before this year or ESPN now, um, you know, they, everybody watches your national games, right? So they all know what you're up to. They all know what you're saying, good and bad. And they all know your face, good and bad. So I think that really helps. Okay, listen, this is a horrible segue, but I wanted to ask you earlier, and now you mentioned your face. And so I'm going right into what is what is the makeup routine for TV? Obviously, I'm a podcast guy. There's nothing that goes into this at all. I went on your Instagram. I saw that you took a picture of kind of like your makeup set earlier, yeah. in, earlier in January. That, that looks intense. How long is the routine to get you all glammed up? It's not, it's, it's not that bad. It used to be longer, but I think, um, you know, during COVID, sometimes we had to do our own makeup and, and uh, which was a disaster. Actually, I got to say, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not bad at it. Um, <laughs> I, I remember once I went to a classroom a few years ago and, uh, you, you know, one of the, a, a couple of the young girls, I think it was a grade three class there, about eight years old. And they were like, do you wear makeup? And I, and I go, yeah. And it turned out that I happened to have I was going from the class to, to, I think, work. So I had my makeup kit with me and I went to the car. I said, I, I said, do we have a couple seconds? I went to my car and I went and I grabbed the makeup bag and I, and I put it on for them and the kids loved it. Like they were like, uh, they thought it was the coolest thing. And, and I, and I, I was telling the, the girls, I'm going to, I'm better at putting makeup than you guys are and your mothers are. And they were laughing and they loved it. Um, and the, and the boys were like, the boys were like, like, we can't even imagine wearing makeup. And I'm like, you know, I'll tell you something. If you guys ever get on TV, you know, now with like high def and I don't know if we were at 4K yet when I did this, probably not. 
But I said, like, guys, this is a lifesaver because in high def and now 4K, you, your, your face can't escape. Like anything you've got in your face, people are going to see it. So, um, you know, but now during COVID, it's, it's, we've learned time. It used to be you'd spend 30 minutes in a makeup chair. And if you've ever seen the set of a movie, you can spend two hours in a makeup chair, depending on what they're doing to you. Now it's like 10, 15 minutes max. And okay. uh, basically what it is, is it's, it's like, uh, it's powder, it's foundation. I use lip stuff because my lips get really dry. People ask me if I dye my hair. I'm like, no, I, I don't dye my hair. Uh, you know, people ask, like, you know, I got crazy eyebrows. So sometimes I trim <laughs> them, you know. That's that's basically it. Okay. Man, they really get into it. Is the dyeing your hair thing? That's got to be a compliment, though, that you're keeping your color still. Well, that's that's what that's what it is. Like uh, like like I have a bald spot now. I had forty good years. Now I've got a bald spot, and they're like, "Why don't you spray it?" And I'm like, "I'm not gonna spray it. Like that's this is what I look like. You got to deal with it." Hey, listen, I had a I had a hair restoration thing. They implanted 25 follicles in, in my head, so you know I went that route. Uh, you know, it didn't it didn't necessarily hold up. But, you know, it's getting the job done. Were you? We were, all we all have to make our choices, right? <laughs> Absolutely. Listen, my whole family, my, my younger brother went bald in high school. So I said, listen, any years I get after this where I can have hair, you know, I'm going to take it for a ride. And that's what I've done. Were you, Elliot, were you in the bubble? Were you in the bubble in Toronto? No, I was not. I was in the studio. In the studio. Okay. Okay. Yes. So were you, yes. how was it covering, covering that for you? It was, it was different. It was harder. I mean, I don't want to like, uh, when I say it was harder, like, look, I don't want to compare myself to any healthcare professional or anything like that. It definitely wasn't as fun. Um, it was harder. I mean, we couldn't sit next to each other. We had to do what was called the four box where there were four boxes on a screen with four different heads. You, it's tougher to do it that way. I mean, the, the thing is now is that you, you, we missed the fans, right? You know, the games were antiseptic. They didn't have a great environment. I remember last year, you know, the first game I attended with fans was game four of the Stanley Cup final. Mm -hmm. And the second was game five, the one in Tampa. And I just remember that night in Tampa, like Seth, how, how different it was. Like we hadn't been in a full building in I don't know how long it was. And I remember me and, D and David Amber turning to each other and saying how much we really missed this. And, um, you know, that's, that's the thing now, like the fact that, you know, I know people are complaining that some of the games are blowouts and that's fine. I think as long as we get to, you know, a series with a lot, a lot of series with games, sixes and sevens, I think it'll all balance out, but geez, just the feeling of having fans in the building again, like how much we just absolutely missed it. All right. Can you go ahead? Can you tell me your, uh, and I don't know if you have anything that matches this, but I, I heard you tell this story on another podcast about, um, walking with Mario Lemieux and uh, him not being granted access and you trying yeah. to be you trying to you trying to be the spokesperson for him. I, have you had any has, is that still the, the top story for you or have you had any interaction with other players where you go oh my god I can't believe that just happened uh, I, there was another one but I can't remember what it was right now I'm gonna have to ask my co-workers my, my I, I can't remember what it was my co-workers were like that's almost as bad as the Lemieux story but the Lemieux story was just bad because like the way he reacted. Uh, and for those of you who are not familiar with it, it was at, it was the NHL All-Star Game in Los Angeles a few years ago where they did the NHL's 100 best greatest players. And Lemieux took the elevator from the press box to the uh, event level, the ice level, and he forgot his pass. And the security guy didn't know who Lemieux was. And I never get mad at a security person for that. They're doing their job. And if you forget your pass, you know, that's your risk. But he was getting annoyed. And I said, you know, can I vouch for this person? This is Mary Lemieux, the second greatest player ever. And he goes, second to who? And Nick Kiprios was there and he died laughing. And Nick has a really big, deep, loud laugh. Like when Nick laughs, everybody hears it. It's one of those ones that everybody, so he, like everybody heard it. And he, that was such a great story. I always remember it. And, uh, there was one recently, I got him, geez, Seth, I care what it was, but I remember the guys looking at me and saying, like, that's almost as bad as Lemieux, but I, I can't remember what it was right now. I, there was one, though. But what, what are the negatives of having so many Twitter followers? You know, like, I, I think that the one thing I always say off the top is I feel grateful that there's that much of an audience that listens to our podcast or reads the blog or things like that. So I generally feel there's much more positives than negatives. 
I just do feel that in the, for whatever reason, during the last two years, during the pandemic, um, the Twitter discourse has gotten much worse, that people are much ruder to each other. I probably read less of my, oh, never mind, probably, I definitely read less of my mentions and DMs than I ever did before. There's just people who think that having a Twitter account is licensed to act like they would never act like that in real life. They would never have the guts to say some of this stuff to your face. And then there's the people who are real bullies from uh, accounts that are hidden or disguised or they don't identify themselves. So not, like I, I honestly believe that eight, eight, more than 80% of it is very positive, that there's an audience that you know really likes to follow, likes to be included, likes to listen, and I'm greatly appreciative, but there's a small group of people that thinks it gives them license to be dicks, really, and or or bullies the way they could never be in real life. And, you know, people say it shouldn't happen. Of course, it shouldn't happen. But there's really not much you can do about it. It's just the way it goes. Are there are there any fan bases that uh, that that seem to, you know, take things out on you and blame you for their team's woes over the years? I'll, I'll just say this as far as, you know, dealing with all of the the teams that the lighting have played over the past couple of years. The, the Montreal fans on social media last year were it, it was some of the scariest stuff that I've ever seen to the point where I won't even say anything bad about Montreal fans anymore because I, I, I was so scared. Is there a fan base that you just feel like, oh, man, these guys are after me again? Well, you know, I, I think that I have some I have a running joke with the Canucks Twitter fan base, but I, I like to think that's mostly in fun. They give it to me and and, and I give it back sometimes. But, you know, like I, I think, like I said, I think most of the people are really good people. There's something about the playoffs, though, Seth, that make it worse. Like, and, and it's probably because it's just what's on the line in the playoffs. Like, for example, yesterday, Darcy Kemper had that eye injury. And I tweeted out that the Johansson stick was an accident, um, that it was accidental. And I had people saying to me, that was no accident. He did that on purpose. And I'm, I'm just... And then like Predators fans, like, how dare you even suggest by writing accidentally that there would even be a presumption that it was on purpose. Oh I was just looking at this and going, oh, my God, like you just like like, you know, some people say to me, you should respond to that. And I said, I I'm not responding to that. Like and, and the other thing, too, is that and I try to tell this to a lot of people. It's very hard in the moment. I recognize it. But in, if you let it breathe for 15 minutes people's attention will focus on to the next thing. Like just don't pour gasoline on the fire. That's what I always tell people. That's a, that's a good, that's a good point. Elliot, uh, I want to know over the past couple of years, maybe since the lightning were swept by Columbus in 19, what's impressed you the most, whether it's been on the ice, off the ice, anything they pulled, they pulled off, you know, what's been something that has really impressed you uh, about the lightning over the last couple of years? Um, I would say, let me just, let me just send this tax. No, you're time. all good. You're all good. Okay. This is, I mean, I can't wait to see what the breaking news is. 1145 on mother's day morning, AM East coast time. Um, okay. So, well, I, I think that there's, there's a few things, um, you know, number one, you know, how close did you come for so many years before you finally won? And uh, I think that the lesson is, too, is that when you guys lost to Columbus, like the, the one thing I really remember about it is you guys lose to Columbus. And not only was that bad enough, but then there were the awards that year and all those guys were up for awards and they're sitting there while uh, Keenan Thompson is just killing them on stage. Right. And like I thought those awards were funny and I thought those awards were important because you know, the, like Keenan Thompson went to places that a lot of people hosting the NHL awards wouldn't have gone. And I think we had to move in that direction. But I would understand if I was Vasilevsky or I was Kucherov or I was John Cooper and I was sitting there, that would have eaten me alive. And they took that and then they came back and they won two cups. And first of all, I think winning is hard. I think winning twice in a row is really hard. Um, so I admire that about them. But the thing I admire about a lot of the lightning is that there's a lot of really resilient guys there. Um, like Kucherov, you know, he's angry all the time, but he's, he's demanding of himself to be a better player. He doesn't demand anything of anyone that he doesn't demand of himself. Like Vasilevsky plays every minute of every playoff game. And to me, he's the MVP of the playoffs. If he's the most important player in the league in the playoffs, 
Um, like, you know, like that game this year in LA where Hedman was like, oh, we've only got 4D. I'm, I'm going to win this game. Like, I, like I'm going to win this game because it's a challenge. Like, I, I really love that. Um, Stamkos this year, like, you know, Stamkos, you know, he's not going to be, I don't think he's going to be on the heart finalist this year, but he had a heart trophy kind of season. And a lot of us thought like he was basically done. And he was a center this year too. He, he took, he took what, five, six times as many face-offs as he did last year. Um, or maybe a bit less than that, but you get the point. You know, I, I think that like you guys have, like, like I, I think there's, there's people, there's two kinds of people in, in these worlds people who are driven to succeed and people who aren't. And I think you've got a lot of really self-motivated people in Tampa who have high standards for themselves and are, are never satisfied. And I think those are, that goes for the players. I think that goes for the coach. I think that goes for the GM. Uh, I think that goes for the owner. I, I think that goes for, I mean, we don't, we don't see, like, I, I bet you it's a situation with the trainers and the equipment people too. And a lot of the staff that we don't see, like your organization is demanding of itself and it's not satisfied. And I think that is the thing to admire about it. And your best players are the, are, are the people most wired for that. And I think that's why teams win when your best players are the most hardwired to make themselves better and be demanding of themselves. You've got a good and winning culture and, and you guys have that. Like I'll tell you this, we're taping this before game four, I guess this is going to run after game four is played. Um, you know, like, like uh, nobody's counting Tampa out in the series. Like Toronto was the fourth best team in the league this year. I think they're a really good team. They have the lead as we got it right now, but do you think anybody in Toronto was comfortable <laughs> or feels that this series is over? Not a chance. Cause you guys are like Jason, the terrible from Friday, the 13th. It's like, just when you think you're dead, you, you're, you're alive again and hiding in a closet. So you guys have earned that respect. I like that. Well, I always say, listen, as long as we have Vazzy, there's just, it's that's, he's the equalizer, you know, and we yeah. just need him. We need him to have one of those games. Hopefully it's tonight where he just steals it for us and, and gets us back on track. So I do want to mention, and I actually talked to coach Cooper a couple of weeks ago, which was an honor to sit down and talk to him over the, you know, over what's going on the past couple of years. But he mentioned, you know, specifically going to those award shows and how it was very tough for him to sit there and hear all those jokes and all that stuff. And I don't know if it necessarily fueled those guys, but he did mention that he didn't think they are at where they are today with two cups if they didn't get swept by Columbus. So I think it all kind of goes into to where they are right now. So I wanted to just let you know that you were definitely right on about that, as you are about most things, Elliot. You already knew that. No, I, I wouldn't say I knew that. I'm probably more wrong than I like to admit. Uh, but I would totally believe that. I, I think that, you know, you probably don't need any more motivation than just losing that series to begin with. But then, like, everybody kicks the crap out of you, right? Like, it's like we go back to social before, you know, like when pylons happen. There's three kinds of people that pile on you. One of the people that are legitimately aggrieved. and But unfortunately, usually that's the smallest group. And then there's the people who just um they they pile on you to join the fun they're like well everybody else is piling on so i have to be cool so i have to pile on too and then there's the group of people that just like to see other people get embarrassed or show that they're better than other people and you know like you guys got all that in the aftermath of that loss to columbus now i think that the loss in, it, itself is enough to but every little thing like when you're and that's the thing i understand when you're in a playoff series and you're tired and you know, some, there's a race to the pocket. It's you versus your opponent and you guys will kill each other to win the battle. You know, every little bit of thing that you can put in your mind to convince you to win that puck battle. And if you're sitting there saying that bleeping Keenan Thompson, like what he said, that <laughs> helps you win a puck battle or get you in the right frame of mind. I, I think these guys use everything. There we go. We're going to need a shirt that damn Keenan Thompson. I think we can get that selling here. Let me just say for the record, I thought it was a great awards and it was, a, he was a great host. No, no, listen, they, they had nobody, nobody was mad. They knew, they knew what happened. And, you know, I, I, I heard he warned like Steve Meyer, who runs this stuff for the NHL told us they warned the lightning in advance. They said that these, some of these jokes were coming. Oh, so man. they were prepared for it. They, they handled it well. Listen, what before I let you go, and I appreciate your time today, can you go ahead and talk about something that is on your social media account right there in the bio, autismjourney.org, and, and why that's important to you? 
Yeah, well, I think most people kind of know this right now. My my son's on the spectrum, and uh, uh, my uh, my my wife created that uh, account. And um, in some ways, it was kind of like a bit of therapy for us, uh, just to kind of get it out there. And um, uh, and you know, like I don't really for a long time we didn't really identify it who it was or what it was because you know, we like our privacy. I, I don't like, I don't know if I've ever posted a, a picture uh, of my son. I, I kind of like, because like we were talking earlier, like 80 to 80, 80% of people are on social are good people. And the other 20% are goofs who ruin it for everyone else. Yeah. yeah. I, I don't like those kinds of people anywhere near my family. So, you know, I keep my son private. And so that's just, you know, um, and there's a lot of people who kind of reach out to me because they see me wear the pin or they kind of know, and that's where I direct them. And, um, you know, uh, she put together like a lot of resources and just some, just some essays and things like that. So people just knew that, you know, you aren't alone out there, that there's other people. I mean, we're getting more, um, you know, we're getting more uh, diagnoses of this than ever before. And I think the part of the reason is I think we're just more aware of it, really. Uh, and so, I, you know, the, the number one thing I just want to let people know is that, um, you know, you're not you're not alone out there. Like there's other people who understand what you're going through. And, um, uh, you know, we're, we're very proud of our guys come a long way. But I think the biggest challenge with that and a lot of other things is. Seth, you just don't know. Like it's it's the unknown. You don't know where your journey is going to take. Like when you have what's called a neurotypical kid, you have no idea where life is taking you, right? Uh, but when you you when you have a child who has some challenges, whether it's this or anything else, or God forbid something more serious, it's it, it's it's the not knowing that's the real killer. So we just like to let people know that you know there's there's people out there with you if there's something else i would promote of my wife's right now she started up an instagram page called uh, serve it up steph and she is a uh, she loves to cook stuff in the kitchen and uh, i'm her guinea pig and i go on and like i eat with my mouth open and stuff and she just rolls her eyes and trashes me and uh um, she's a really good cook and uh, I've had a few people in the hockey world start messaging me and saying this is now my my favorite Instagram page and Instagram feed so uh, oh, she's wait. trying to do some stuff is this What's it right that? here vegan peanut butter mousse is that yes that's her yeah wow yeah. this is I'm throwing I don't know how to make anything but I'm taking this right here these are just fun to look at yeah she does good videos and she she really takes pains to do them properly she bought a stand so she could light them properly and uh, she's she's very talented and she's much better looking than her husband. So uh, <laughs> that's 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 her Instagram page. And I go on there and I try her food. And uh, there's a, there's a few people around our friends and some of my coworkers and some people in the league have seen it now. And uh, and they get a good laugh out of it. All right. They really like it uh, because it's Mother's Day. I'm not going to ask you what the worst thing she's had you try lately is. And I don't want to cause any drama today. No, I got to Seth. Like I, I like it. Like, uh, like I didn't realize this, but I guess I'm a really picky eater. There's, a, I've always thought I was not, but apparently I am. And she did a video about that. So, but like generally, she says, um, you know, try something. I will always gladly try it. Like I like, I like doing that. I like. She's a good cook, so and she likes to experiment. So I'm happy to be the uh, the guinea pig. I like that. I like, I'm afraid of everything. So I, I like, I like, the, <laughs> I like the adventurous types. I admire them. NHL insider for Sportsnet. The podcast is awesome. Uh, I'm a huge podcast guy. 90% of the podcasts out there completely suck. You have an excellent one. So I, hope, <laughs> I mean, it's true. I hope anybody thinks that they, cause they get a microphone, they can talk to a podcast. Uh, you guys have a great one. So I hope everybody checks that out. And I appreciate the time today. No problem, Seth. Happy, uh, happy mother's day, to your wife and enjoy the game. She better enjoy it too. <laughs> <laughs>